Hi, and welcome to session one of Construction Contracts Claims and Dispute Resolution. Today we are going to have a brief introduction and review of the course objectives. Um, we're going to talk about the general contracting process, some fundamentals of construction contracting, um, some basic principles of contract law. We're going to touch on the various parties that are involved in the construction project, and we are going to um, go into some depth on the different types of project delivery that you may encounter um, on a construction project and some of the pros and cons of those various types of uh, delivery methods. So we're gonna jump right in. Um, you may not, unless you are a lawyer or unless you are working at currently a um, company where you are heavily involved in the contract negotiation, um, previously given much thought to the, I guess, contracting process in terms of how a uh, construction project uh, is pretty much born um, from the beginning. So typically what will happen on a project is there is a client who decides that there is a need um, for some sort of um, project to, to happen. And whether that client is a public client or a private client is going to determine um, a bunch of things and we're gonna get into a little depth on that. But in essence, a potential client comes up and decides that there is a need for a project um, and what they will do typically is they will issue um, some sort of a solicitation, some sort of a, a request um, to the public or to a certain number of contractors or architects and engineers um, or any other construction professional um, asking them for uh, typically one of either two things, either what is known as an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications, which is a very preliminary um, summary of the qualifications uh, and the abilities um, of that particular party in order to meet the needs of a specific project, um, or the client may issue a uh, RFP, which is known as a request for proposal, which is slightly more in depth, which actually will involve um, the respondent putting forward typically a bid and a summary of the exact services that they would provide on connection with this specific project. Um, again, so a request for qualification, um, pretty much is a statement as to why uh, that specific party is qualified in terms of whatever services they typically provide and a request for a proposal or an RFP, um, which is typically a much more detailed um, actual proposal with pricing and specific services laid out for a specific project. Um, so once a potential client has issued a, either a, a request for qualifications or a request for proposal, uh, at that point, the various parties, the contractors or AE, depending on where they are in, in the solicitation, will issue bids. Um, so the requirements for bids are gonna differ based upon who the end client actually is. If you are a public client or you're a private client, um, the requirements for bidding will differ and we'll touch upon that. And the bids are also gonna differ based upon where the project is located. If you are located in New York, um, they have very specific, in New York City, there's very specific uh, you know, New York rules and regulations that govern um, versus the project is located elsewhere, which may have other very specific rules, um, but maybe not the same rules that New York has. Um, so we are gonna focus typically on the New York rules um, since this class is primarily based in New York. Um, and if there are other, other, other areas where um, folks are located, we certainly, um, I certainly welcome um, discussion topics and we can certainly go into nuances of other locations, um, which would be very interesting. Um, so typically when a bidder is going to respond to a, a request for some sort of a solicitation, the, the contractor is going to review um, the design, which typically has either been done um, or has been partially done. They're gonna review the specifications and the, the technical requirements, and they will put a price to bid. Um, and we talked about briefly, but the requirements that that is going to take is going to um, differ based upon if it is a public project or a private project. Um, so for public projects, um, public projects have some very specific requirements. Um, one, they typically require competitive bidding, um, meaning that they have to be put out on the street um, with an ability for you know uh, pretty much anyone who wants to be able to respond to the bid um, to submit a proposal. Um, there isn't typically sole, what's known as sole source or a direct commission um, proposals where a client um, will decide that they want to do a specific project and they will just go directly to a contractor and say, um, you know, we have this project and we'd really like you specifically to do it. Just, you know, sort of submit a proposal and that's all you need to do. Um, that is not allowed uh, on public projects. 
you have to go through a competitive, competitive bidding uh, process. Um, part of the reason of that is that for public projects, um, there is legal requirements that the award of a project has to go to what is known as the lowest responsible bidder. Um, and the lowest responsible bidder, for all intents and purposes from a legal perspective, is the cheapest bidder. Um, it is considered the lowest costing bidder who is still you know, highly qualified to provide the services required for the project. Um, this is different than private. In private uh, procurement, when there's a private client who's looking to do a project, um, again, we said there's no, there's no typically requirement to go out for competitive bidding. Um, footnote on that, there could be, and we'll talk about this when we get into different delivery methods, if you were a private client who potentially is helping to facilitate on a public project, um, because you were a developer and you either have some sort of a lease agreement or you have some sort of another vested interest in what is you know, a public, public land or a public project, there may be a requirement to do competitive bidding, even though technically you are a private client um, because the, the land or the, the kind of back of house client is really a, a public project, a public client. Um, so private clients, there's no requirement to do the competitive bidding typically. Um, and there's also no requirement to go to the lowest responsible bidder. So in a private uh, client situation, that client can can really pick whoever it is that they you know that they want to, and that person may, may be you know the cheapest bidder, and they also could be the most expensive. Um, you know there isn't any sort of guidelines in terms of requirements as to um, you know who they award a project to. So New York has some specific requirements for public projects, um, namely they have what is known as the Wix law, um, New York the general municipal law, and the state finance law. Um, collectively have a combined requirement that for certain public projects, um, there has you have to hire different contracts, different contractors um, for very specific trades. Specifically, there's four, you have to hire a different contractor for the general contracting, the GC, and you have to hire a different contractor for plumbing, the electrical work, and the heating ventilation work. Um, the purpose of this, and this, this law has been around for a very, very long time, it's been subject to a pretty extensive you know, literature and debate. Um, I, I'm going to post a couple of articles about it. Um, there are people who, who feel very strongly that this is a benefit, and there are some people who feel very strongly that this is something that should be and should have been done away with uh, years ago. But the original purpose was to guarantee an expertise in these specific trade areas um, so that you didn't have one firm um, kind of a jack of all trades providing the general contracting and the plumbing and also the electrical and the HVAC. Um, you had somebody who was truly skilled in plumbing, providing the plumbing, and someone who was truly skilled in the electrical services, providing electrical, et cetera. Um, the proponents of the of Wix law will argue that it does create um, you know, more expertise in the various areas. Um, some will argue that potentially you may get better pricing um, because instead of a, a general contractor, you know, including kind of just a markup and an overarching fee based upon various subtrades, you are getting more specialized pricing um, directly based upon um, the specifications for the specific trades because you have kind of more of a specialized uh, party bidding on those trades. People who don't like Wix Law will typically argue that um, there's a feeling that it may create additional costs. Um, because um, sometimes there is there's hidden markups in some of the uh, bids, and that if you're going now going out to you know four separate trades, you may be technically subject, uh, maybe maybe not even knowingly, to four separate slight markups um, for separate maybe cost increases for insurance or other things that you know the four different um, you know contracting parties may need to include in their price where they may not have had to include that if they were a single party, um, you know, subbing out or providing all of those services. Um, there are some people who also argue that potentially it creates additional coordination issues. There is a feeling that if you had a central, um, you know, a central contractor who maybe was overseeing this and perhaps was doing all of the trades, you maybe would have less coordination given that you are now dealing with four separate trades um, dealing each with the specifications for those four separate different um, different services, and, and perhaps that those four different parties are not um, giving as much attention 
as if it was one party or, or less than four parties in terms of how the specifications um, and how the services may overlap on each other. Um, and the, you know, people who think that Wix law potentially is not a, a great thing, think that by siloing um, those four different trades, you may potentially be creating additional work um, that isn't creating a benefit to the public at large. Um, so once you have, you've sent out and you've, and you've put a bid, um, you've given thought to, are you on a public or a private project and what does that mean in terms of the requirements and who might win? Um, typically you can give some thought to maybe some of the issues that might arise during bidding. Um, you know, I think that we don't maybe necessarily give a lot of thought to things that can go wrong in the bidding process. Um, I can tell you that from my own personal professional experience, I have seen, um, you know, I have seen things that have happened in the bid process, um, which concern, which, which can set a, a project off, you know, really from, with an issue from the start. So some examples of this, um, probably the most common one would be um, what's known as a mistake. And so there's really two different types of mistakes. There's an excusable mistake, which is one that probably could be revised um, and most likely won't result in a disqualification of the bidder. Um, an example, probably the most clear-cut example of an excusable mistake is um, what's really known as a clerical mistake. So I think one of the simplest examples is, you know, a bidder is typing up their bid and they they mean to put in that the bid is, you know, $10 million um, and they accidentally put in that it's $100 million or they mean to put in that it's $100 million and they accidentally leave out a zero and it comes across now as $10 million. Um, typically a court and typically um, even, even a public entity will allow, if it is obvious, um, the, the remedy and fixing of a, a excusable clerical mistake. If it's clear on its face that there really was no way that someone could think that that was what they were, um, you know, what they were, what they actually were bidding on the project. Sometimes those are not as clear. Um, there can definitely be clerical mistakes that are maybe um, not as obvious. I can say in in my own professional um, my own professional world, I have seen it, typically mistakes that come less in numbers and more in the scope. I have seen. Um, where, where we have had project managers who meant to exclude um, certain scope items potentially from a bid. And instead of saying that they were excluded, um, the language is maybe not completely clear. And, um, or, or when they were cut and, cutting and pasting, they accidentally cut and paste um, items that were supposed to be either included or excluded, and they included them in the wrong section. Um, those items are generally less likely to be um, allowed to be revised or or will be allowed to um, you know be remedied if they come to light after the bid has been submitted. I have seen problems um, where where firms have submitted with things that have um, you know pretty basic clerical mistakes that are maybe not as obvious that have led to pretty significant financial implications um, in terms of excluding certain scope accidentally when they meant to include it or vice versa, um, and then not including those things in their fee, but now being required to actually provide them. So separate from an excusable delay, there's also a non-excusable delay, similar to what you just talked about. Um, and those non-excusable delays, you're not going to be able to revise, and they may result in a disqualification if you are submitting on a project. So an example of a non-excusable delay would be what we just talked about, where Perhaps it's clerical, but it, it really looks like it's more of a, um, you know, an unexcusable mistake that was just sloppy drafting um, where it's not really clear whether or not it was a, a true mistake as simple as a 10 million versus 100 million because no, no person could imagine that that was their bid. Um, but maybe it's something a little bit more nuanced where it's not as clear from the document. But probably a more obvious example of a non-excusable delay would be um, if a party is ignoring a key term. So if a party is ignoring a key specification to potentially create a lower bid, um, so they leave out a specific scope or they um, specifically put in as an exclusion a specific scope in order to lower the overall bid to potentially be more competitive. Um, and then when they, when that is, I guess, found out, 
they claim that it, that that was actually an ex, that, that was a mistake and they didn't mean to exclude that. Um, if there is enough evidence to show that 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 potentially was purposeful, um, most courts will say that that's a non-excusable, um, there's non-excusable mistake, and that the bidder will be held to the original bid, um, but they will be disqualified from the uh, the pursuit.